All right. Hello, everybody. Thank you all so much for joining us for a COVID-19 individual artists and creative workers meeting with the Mayor's Office of Arts and Culture. My name is Pascal Floresa. I'm the Arts Emergency Preparedness Coordinator, and um, I'll also be co-hosting this meeting with Julia Ryan. Julia, could you introduce yourself, please? Hi, everyone. My name is Julia Ryan, and I'm the city's arts um, artist resource manager. I work in the Mayor's Office of Arts and Culture. And I've been doing this work for a little over three years now. And I recently have been focusing a lot of my efforts on um, COVID-19 related resources for artists. So today's meeting, um, we'll be mostly talking a little bit about what's happening in Boston, what the update is from the city, and we'll be talking a little bit about the current relief funds as well as some surveys that are being going around and what we have Luke from the uh, volunteer lawyers from the arts today to help with talking about unemployment as well as Emily Ruddock from Mass Creative to talk a little bit about what's going on from the state level. Um, we have some other speakers and we'll move through the PowerPoint in just a second. This will also be recorded. So we'll be able to upload this recording of this meeting on the Boston website. Um, probably tomorrow morning, hopefully, if not sooner. Uh, so if anyone misses or has any questions or would like to send this to somebody, please just know that you'll see this recording on the website um, probably tomorrow morning. We'll also be sending the uh, slide deck of this presentation to all of the participants. So you may not be able to click any of the links on the PowerPoint today, which is totally fine. We will be sending you those links as well as the PowerPoint after this meeting. Um, so if you have any questions about that, feel free to let us know. And throughout the time, if you have any questions for any of our speakers or anything particular comes up, please use the chat function so that we're able to read the questions out loud so that everyone's able to know what the question is and we'll be, do our best to get those answers to you. All right. Okay, so here's the agenda for everyone. Just like I went through um, earlier, we'll also have uh, Paloma Valenzuela, who is a Boston Artist Fellow, to talk about her experience with COVID-19 and how things are going for her. Okay, all right, Cara, I'll send it over to you for the update about the coronavirus in Boston. Pascal, I think I could actually take that um, if you'd like. And um, and just so everyone knows, Cara Elliott Ortega, our Chief of Arts and Culture, is here today as well um, and will be available to answer questions as well. Um, and I think, should we, Pascal, should we do this first or should we have Kate um, say a few words? Oh, yeah, Kate, go ahead. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. So um, Kate Gilbert is here. Um, Kate Gilbert is the Executive Director of Now and There and um, she has a few words just to share with us all today. Thanks, um, Pascal, Julia, and Cara. Thanks for bringing us all together like this. Um, um, as an artist and an arts um, administrator, it's, um, I know how hard it is for everyone here to be doing all of this, including um, trying to be creative. Um, and um, I just really appreciate this space for all of us to come together and, and ask the difficult questions and be vulnerable. Um, it's what we've been trying to do at Now and There. Uh, we have this Friday program, program called Now and There Asks, where we pair an artist and a community member together to, to just ask these, these tough questions about what is, the, what is the role of art? How do we um, support those who are, are struggling the most right now? And you know, can we even think about a future together? Um, and, and we have about 75 people on that call, but I think those are mostly people who are interested in public art. And I'm grateful that you guys are putting this call together. And hopefully there are a lot of us across all of these disciplines that can begin to reimagine um, our spaces together. Um, so it, yeah, it's, it's both, I mean, I, I'm, I'm just here to say, um, let's keep going. Um, I know everyone's taking this differently. People are gonna slow down and, and get a little more introspective. And then I think there are um, those who are just gonna keep um, producing and putting work out there. So whatever I can do personally um, to support your practices or now and there can do to um, ask the difficult questions, please reach out to me. My email is kate at nowandthere.org, ask questions on here and um, definitely join us this Friday. We meet every day, every Friday at 1230. 
um, and you can find more information at nowandthere.org slash asks, which I can drop into the chat right now. Thanks. Great, thank you so much, Kate. Um, so anyways, again, welcome from um, the city of Boston. My name is Julia Ryan, and I am our artist resource manager, and I'm going to be um, flying through some information today about artist relief funds, um, our own relief fund, and then also others that might be a resource to you during this time. Um, before I get started, I just want to do a few quick updates about numbers related to um, coronavirus in the city of Boston and also a few um, updates from the city about things um, to do right now to help contain the spread of coronavirus. So um, first off, these numbers are from Friday, so they have probably changed a bit by now. Um, but in Boston, we have um, a little under 5,000 cases confirmed of COVID-19. And of those cases, 708 of them are fully recovered. 122 of those cases have unfortunately been deaths. Um, as of now, the Boston Public Schools are closed through May 4th, but that is subject to change. Um, and we also have a daily text line where we're sending updates to community members in six different languages, which you can sign up for through um, the city's website. We also have provided the directions here in this PowerPoint. Um, the city has created a dashboard that we're updating regularly to keep everyone informed about various resources and um, regulations and updates related to COVID-19 in Boston. And in terms of um, measures to help reduce the spread of coronavirus, the mayor is um, recommending that everyone use face coverings when out in public. So this would be a covering that is covering your nose and your mouth. And it can be something that's homemade. It could be a scarf, it could be a bandana, or it could be something more um, elaborate. Music Maker Relief Fund. Um, this is a fund out of the Record Co. And these are rapid grants of up to $200 for Boston-based musicians. Um, they have a deadline of April 30th, so that's coming up, so people should check that out now. Um, there's also the Cambridge Artist Relief Fund, which is a complementary fund to the Boston Artist Relief Fund for artists who live in the city of Cambridge. Um, those grants are grants of up to $1,000, and they actually are also including grants for arts organizations, um, and a limited amount of those grants will be at, at a $5,000 level. Um, they're planning to keep their grant open for six months, so they opened it in mid-March and continue, will continue to have it open for six months following that. Um, the Theater Community Benevolent Fund is a grant fund for individual theater practitioners and also for theater companies. Um, that, that grant is up to $1,500 for individuals and up to $6,000 um, $6, for theater companies. And they don't have a deadline on that. That's a rolling grant. Um, lastly, the Keep Your Distance Fest Pair Fund is still open for applications. And that is a grant of up to $500 for artists who've played gigs at Paseem and also taught um, through the School of Music in the last 10 years. And the one stipulation is that you participate in the Keep Your Distance Fest, which has been a virtual festival that they're running um, online. And there's no deadline for that as well. So two similar funds that I wanted to mention, um, but at kind of a broader scale, are the Mass Cultural Council COVID-19 relief funds for individuals. So that's a grant that actually has their first round deadline tomorrow. So I highly recommend everyone check that out today. That's for individual artists of all artistic disciplines across the state of Massachusetts. So those grants are up to a thousand and they're for any lost income derived from work as an individual artist an independent teaching artist, humanist, or scientist. Um, in addition to that, there's the Foundation for Contemporary Arts Grants um, for COVID-19 funds, and that's a national grant. Um, it's grants of up to $1,500 for individual artists who are based in the United States and who work in contemporary or experimental um, arts, and it doesn't have a deadline either. And just something to note is that we would be happy to share all these links with everyone who attended um, this call after the call. Um, there's the Artist Relief Fund, which is for individual artists that 
um, live in the United States, these are really big grants. They're grants of $5,000 and they have their first round deadline this Thursday. So I also really highly encourage people apply now. Um, I know that they've been receiving a high volume of requests, so people should draft uh, their application in a Google Doc just in case there's any glitches. Um, but that's for any practicing artists who can demonstrate that they've lost work and that they're committed to their artistic practice um, through their work and careers. Um, let's see. Um, there are a few grants that I wanted to mention for specific populations. So there's the South Asian Arts Resiliency Fund. That's a grant for arts workers of South Asian descent who are over 21 years old. Um, they have their own definition for arts workers, so I would recommend checking that out, but it's pretty broad. Um, these are grants of at least $1,000, and the only requirement is that um, grantees must be able to receive taxable income in the United States. Their first round deadline is this Friday, April 24th. And then there's the Queer Writers of Color Relief Fund. So that's also a national fund with grants of up to $500 for queer writers of color. Um, and it also doesn't have a deadline. And then lastly, there's the Arts Leaders of Color Emergency Fund. And that is a national fund for Black, Indigenous, people of color artists and arts administrators who've been impacted by COVID-19 in the United States. And these are $200 micro grants with no deadline as well. So I think that's everything I was gonna run through today for, um, for relief funds. And we're gonna move on to Luke, who's gonna talk to us about unemployment. Thank you, Luke. No problem. Hey everyone, good morning. My name is Luke Blackadar. I'm the Director of Legal Services at the Arts and Business Council Greater Boston. I run our Volunteer Lawyers for the Arts program, um, many of which many of you I'm sure are familiar with. Um, and I'm just doing a brief update on kind of the unemployment situation here in Massachusetts. So as some of you may know, because I've seen you mention in the chat, our Pandemic Unemployment Assistance Program has gone live. The new um, Massachusetts version of the federal program. So basically what that is for those who don't know is that part of the CARES Act was to expand unemployment benefits to populations who historically had always been excluded from receiving unemployment insurance. Um, so you know generally people who are um, ineligible for traditional unemployment which includes populations like self-employed workers, gig workers, independent contractors, etc. Part of the uh, federal statute was to create this new pandemic unemployment assistance program, which expands those benefits. Um, so Massachusetts just launched the um, pandemic unemployment assistance application yesterday. And as some of you have noted in the chat, there are a couple hiccups with it. So generally in traditional unemployment, what you would do is you fill out an application, you go to the website, you'd set up a profile, give them your basic information, contact information, social security number, um, how you want to receive your benefits, employment information, identity of your job, your employer, um, what your work week looks like. You would submit that. Your employer would then verify all that information. Yes, they work this job. Yes, they work these many hours. Yes, they were laid off or terminated for this reason. Um, and then the Department of Unemployment Assistance will determine what your benefit rates are, and then they will um, you know, start issuing benefits. The thing about unemployment is that you have to certify that you need benefits every week. So usually starting on Sunday, you'll start certifying for the prior week that yes, I still need to continue benefits, I'm still unemployed. And you need to do that every week, even while your application is pending. And this is the case both in traditional unemployment and for the pandemic and employment assistance application that just came out yesterday. So um, even if your application is pending before the department, you still need to apply or you still need to certify that you have a continuing need on a weekly basis. Because even when your application is approved and you're cleared for receiving unemployment benefits, um, the department will not issue benefits for a week that you did not certify. So that's a really just important thing to know of the general framework. The difference with now the pandemic unemployment assistance application is that 
you are self-certifying. There's not an employer at the other end who's going to certify your hours, your wages, et cetera. It's on you as an independent contractor or as a self-employed individual. So the application, those of you who have gone through it, it's dis it, it almost looks like it's too easy and that it's kind of deceptively easy. It's a few pages, a few prompts, um, and they'll ask you a laundry list of different questions that kind of, the idea is to uh, hone in on whether you're eligible for this type of uh, unemployment assistance. Um, and then you're basically done. Um, the thing is, currently, the idea is that you'll be able to certify or the, the department will probably ask you for documentation proving your income or employment um, at a later time because the, the way it is right now is that they set up the application and if you're eligible, you should apply right now. But the problem is that the Department of Unemployment Assistance isn't really equipped yet to be handling and processing the applications on the back end. That might not start happening for another week and a half. That August or that April 30th date that we were originally proposed. So if you're able to apply, apply now, get that in as soon as you possibly can, but just know it still might take a little bit of more time um, for your benefits to actually get processed, for your application to get processed, for you to get a decision, for your benefits to start um, coming in. So one question I see in the chat is, is there a mixed 1099 W-2 option? And I suspect this is gonna be the case for most of you guys, is that you're gonna have either a part-time W-2 job and maybe supplement your income with 1099s or vice versa. You're primarily 1099, a lot of your, the majority of your income derives from your private, your personal art practice, and maybe you have a couple um, W-2 part-time jobs. So the current guidance from the department is if you earn at least $5,100 from W-2 income from an employer who withholds your taxes for you, apply through traditional unemployment. So do the regular unemployment application that has always existed. Um, try that system first. And then if you're denied, cite that denial when you reapply for pandemic unemployment assistance. And that's kind of going to be the advice that I give a lot of people based on their circumstances. Like, you know, oh, I, I'm an independent contractor. I applied for pandemic unemployment assistance. They told me go through the traditional method, do it. Go through the traditional unemployment insurance application. If you get approved, great. If you get denied, Note that denial, document it, and then go back and apply for pandemic unemployment assistance again. The problem is we set up this expanded system, but it doesn't quite contemplate people in your position quite yet. Um, I have a hybrid. I do a little bit of 1099. I do um, a little bit of W-2 or different proportions thereof. Um, so that's just one thing to know. Another question that comes up that I think someone brought up earlier in the chat as well is, well, I have income from another state and I clicked that little button on the application that says I earned income from outside of Massachusetts and it told me apply for traditional unemployment. Same deal, go through the traditional route. If you get denied, go back in through the um, pandemic unemployment assistance application again. Um, there isn't really a good solution for that yet, uh, I know that there are some folks have gone through who've said, I get income from out of state and I've applied for PW, uh, PUA and they told me go through regular. I applied for the regular and it didn't really understand my income that I had W-2s or what have you from out of state. It's a little bit of a challenge. Again, the system, they're still ironing out the kinks and there are a lot of kinks in it. Um, so the best we can offer at this point is go through PWA first. If they direct you to un traditional unemployment, do that and then go back. Um, Lucas, we have a few questions. Do you want yeah. me to read them out to you? Sure. Um, the first one is, how do we know what date we should self-certify? Is it a standard date each week? Um, you have to certify, so what you'll do is once you apply, once you submit your application, you will self-certify. You certify for the previous week, but you can certify, I believe, anytime 
on the current week for the previous week. The days, it starts on Sunday. So you can start certifying for the previous week on Sunday. Um, does that answer the question? Um, yes. Um, okay. Then the next question um, is PUA question. Most of my clients don't issue a 1099 to me. Can I submit my Schedule C to prove self-employment income? Yeah, they're very, very broad as to what types of documentation they'll accept for proof of income. So when you do the initial application right now, they're not gonna ask you to upload or submit anything, but they probably will ask you to submit it at a later date. At this point, you're self-certifying, but they say W-2s, 1099s, your tax forms, your invoices, bank statements, any type of official documentation you have reflecting your income from your self-employment practice is going to be sufficient. Um, and of course, we'll know more as more of these applications go further along and we actually have people at the Department of Unemployment Assistance reviewing them, we'll get more sense of what types of documents are better. But for right now, yes, keep everything and any kind of official documentation like that is gonna be fair game. Okay, um, thank you, Lucas. Um, the next question is, are there any resources for freelancers? So in terms of unemployment, this is, this is really it. So if you're a freelancer, you're, you're gonna be self-employed. Um, so you would apply through this pandemic unemployment assistance program. This is, this is really the, the main game. Unless you're getting significant W-2 income, then you're gonna to wanna to apply through this system. Um, and that is even if you have kind of a mix of W-2 and 1099, if you have you know, a number of 1099s from a bunch of different clients, um, really the trigger that's gonna determine based on your income, which system you should apply through is going to be whether you are above that $5,100 W-2 uh, benchmark or below it. Again, if you earn at least $5,100 in the whole year of 2019, from a W-2 employee employer who withheld taxes, then you'll apply through traditional unemployment. Okay. Um, Liz, we can't hear you right now, I think. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, sorry. There's a sub question to that. Um, does the tax documents have to be from 2019 or can they use 2018 info if they haven't done their 2019 tax file yet? That should be okay. I mean, as long as you have documents that reflect like, again, if you have pay stubs or if you have invoices, if you have your bank statements, which you're certainly gonna have on a monthly or a quarterly basis, those will also help support it. If you need to use your previous taxes and your previous Schedule C to paint a picture and construct what you expect it'll look like, that should be fine. But what you do want is contemporaneous documents. So in that case, you probably wanna use your bank statements, your invoices, and what documentation you do have to support your current income. Okay, thank you. Um... Okay, um, next question is, what if you're still employed by them, the W-2 can, how can you apply for unemployment from a place that is still paying you? It depends on how much income you're earning. So you can still apply for unemployment if your income is reduced. If your hours are reduced, then you still are eligible for even traditional unemployment income. So if you've gone from full-time to half-time or some permutation thereof, then you are still eligible for unemployment under both systems. You just have to be able to document what the difference in hours and the difference in pay are. But if, for example, you're a W-2 employee and you've lost all of your 1099 gigs and those 1099 gigs amount to a substantial amount of your income, then you are still eligible for unemployment. It's a question of, is that W-2 employer paying you more than $5,100 for the year and are they withholding taxes? But yes, even if you've still only lost income and you're not fully unemployed, you are still eligible for unemployment benefits. And that's been the case even under the original traditional unemployment system. Okay. 
Um, just FYI, we only have about two <laughs> minutes or so with Luke. We can um, answer the rest of the questions towards the end. Mm -hmm. um, next question is, um, what if this is your first year as a gig worker and you don't have a 1099? So the Pandemic Unemployment Assistance Program does include people who have not previously had a job before. Um, you guys are still eligible. So that would, you would apply through the traditional system, document the income you have now, definitely indicate, yes, I didn't have income through this during 2019, but I did have a job now. I did get a job and that job has now been curtailed because of COVID-19. You're still eligible, document that, have that documentation ready. And there is a prompt for that, I believe, on the application, on the pandemic and employment system application. Okay, thank you. Um, we're going to take two more questions. Would that be okay? Or or should we just leave the rest towards the end? Julia Pascal. Let's take two more questions. They're important. Yeah. Okay. okay. Um, then next question is, um, Luke, what is the best way to get updated info from A and B, C as the situation develops? Um, so we are constantly updating our resource page on our website. It's artsandbusinesscouncil.org forward slash COVID-19. I'll throw it in the chat because um, no one's going to remember that. But we are updating those documents every day um, as new information arises. And we try and circulate emails on a weekly basis, if not more frequently, as more pertinent information becomes available. So definitely keep an eye on that website. Again, I'll drop it in the chat. But that is where the lion's share of our resources and our documents and our FAQs and one sheets on all of these programs are uh, available and we're updating them very frequently. Okay, and then last question is until later on, what about income from selling art at art fairs? That would still, I mean, that is still, that's still qualifying income. That's still income from your self-employment practice. That's still income from your law, from your arts practice, law practice. I mean, slip. Um, so yeah, I would keep track of those invoices and those receipts. So whatever, um, if you're using a point of sale system, have that, those reports ready. If, you know, output to QuickBooks or what have you, have those sheets ready and have those forms ready, but that's still going to be your, um, it's not necessarily, it's not 1099, but that is your self-employment income that, cause that's income from sale of goods. So that's very traditional, um, just business income. So that would probably just be from whatever output you have from your point of sale system or your receipts, your sales slips, what have you, but that does count. That's still income. Great. Thank you so much, Luke. And thank you so much, Elizabeth, for fielding our questions. We'll have time for the last like 20-ish, 15 minutes for Luke to come back or anybody else to, if they have questions um, to answer them at that time. So if we can move to the next slide, I'd love to uh, give the mic to Paloma who will be able to talk about how her art has been impacted, how she's adapting and what are some challenges she's facing during COVID-19. Hi everybody. <laughs> I hope you're all well and safe. Um, <clears throat> I wasn't sure if I should just follow the questions or if someone will tell me, ask me the questions because I have the document. <laughs> Is it my MS of the semester, right? Go yeah, for it. Just the questions. Perfect. Yeah, just, just go for it. <laughs> and those are all prompts. So feel free to go in whatever direction you would like to. Okay, wait, no, I'm here. Hold on. Wait for it. Um, okay. So, uh, yeah, my name is Paloma Valenzuela. I am an artist here in Boston. <clears throat> I'm a writer, director, producer. Like, of all times to have something in my throat, I swear, guys, this is nothing. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> my, I'm, I freelance, I've been freelancing since 2014. <clears throat> I feel like, I, I honestly feel like, 2019 is the year that I finally got I got the hang of it of the freelancing. So if you can imagine, I've um, was a full time teacher in the Dominican Republic and uh, working also part time as a script editor in the Dominican Republic. And in 2000 and 
14, I decided to leave my job um, as a full-time teacher. And I moved back to Boston just as a way to kind of like, kind of bounce back and come home to my family and figure out what I'm going to do. So yeah, so that's when I started um, <clears throat> basically trying to find uh, ways to um, sustain my income and continue to work as an artist full time. And um, the biggest way that I have been able to supplement my income is to work as a teaching artist. I've, um, I've done touring of uh, workshops, writing workshops, and, um, and I've been able to uh, sustain my art through applying for grants and et cetera, et cetera. So uh, it's funny because I left my job as a teacher and right now at this very moment, the, the biggest thing holding me together is my teaching <laughs> jobs. Um, not to say that I'm not working on how it is that I can continue to do my art in the digital world, um, but uh, personally, um, Aside from teaching at organizations like Grub Street um, or in certain institutes like the Institute of Contemporary Art, where I, I, I've taught classes and I've taught at Raw Artworks in Lynn, um, these are all physical classes, workshops with um, young artists. Um, you know, I also would tour my workshops as a way to promote my work and my show. Um, and that was something I was planning to do this year because we finished the third season of a web series that I create called The Pineapple Diaries. The Pineapple Diaries is this comedic web series that um, we produce and launch on YouTube. And we produced the, the episodes, like we filmed the episodes last summer, um, kind of trickled throughout. We, we had some filming days even in the fall and in the winter. <laughs> we tried to make it look like summertime. And then, um, and then uh, turn of two, like end of 2019, I was starting to edit the episodes and launch them. So I feel very grateful and it's only just, it's coincidental, but just that, um, uh, that by the time this whole situation started, I was already kind of working from home. The big bulk of the filming had been completed. And just to think that if, you know, if this, if, this were happening before we were going to begin to produce and film, we'd have to cancel filming. And I think about that all the time, just how grateful I am personally that we were able to, to complete the, the project that we started because I was able to continue to work from home. Um, and so <clears throat> uh, that, and then I, I also, you know, was going to, um, I was going to give doing speaking engagements. I do speaking engagements. I do uh, workshops at conferences. I was going to be, I was uh, really excited to be at the, the Muse uh, conference at Grub Street that has been suspended for obvious reasons. And, um, and a, a, a writing festival that was happening at Emerson actually the week that things started to kind of lock down. So um, I've lost those gigs, any physical gigs, but I'm really grateful that um, my teaching jobs, even my residency at Urbano has decided to go digital. So that's what I'm trying to learn kind of how to adapt to. How do I teach my classes online? How do I, how can I create, how can I create for the future online? Thinking about that, you know, I was hoping to produce something in the Dominican Republic this year. That's not gonna happen. Anything that has to do with production, even with, even with one or two actors always will entail production coordinators, production assistants, camera, sound, um, there's a whole crew of people, so not very easy to social distance in that sense. So just thinking about how how can I rearrange my thought process at this point, and instead of instead of being sad about it, which of course it is sad and disappointing to think that you can't look forward to creating or producing something this year in terms of a film production. In my case, um, what what can I do that I can still do? Was that like a huge rant? <laughs> No, that's great. That's great. Are okay. there any, I, I guess the only other thing, um, I guess other people are wondering too, is what are some things that you're thinking about doing or hoping to do with it, with the time you have now, um, before we all are able to emerge together? Well, personally, you know, and I, I was having, a, <clears throat> I have this silly Instagram live talk show that I'm doing now. And trust me, it, this is not my stick. Like I, you know, I, I'm definitely, uh, I'll sell myself as an actress once in a while, but for the most part, I like to be behind the scenes. I'm, I'm really just a writer and director. That's my thing. But I was compelled for some odd reason <laughs> to create a talk show 
on Instagram just as a way to kind of give me a reason to get dressed up and to connect with my friends from a distance and to have a little fun. We just play games on the show. And I had um, Veronica Robles on last night and she's doing amazing work with her, uh, with her cultural center, Veronica Robles um, Cultural Center. And she's just, cre she's just like on fire. She's creating um, this space for artists to kind and, and even thinking for the future to create some sort of digital festival where we can all um, present together and kind of create that network. And um, so, you know, I, you know, I feel, <clears throat> oh, and she was also saying that she's going to take time to really cultivate her YouTube channel now and stuff like that. So I just have this long to-do list of things that I can do right now on my own that can keep keep my work going. So for instance, I subtitle my episodes. I, I subtitle the episodes of the show in Spanish and I caption them in English because, you know, the YouTube captions be a little hot mess sometimes. So I, you know, having the time to sit and do that, to really go episode by episode from season one to season three, to check my subtitles, to add um, and, 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 and improve the English captions so that the show is entirely available in correct English captions and in Spanish subtitles is something that is time consuming and something I can do right now. Promoting the show is something that I'm deciding to do. I'm doing this talk show as a way to kind of keep some sort of optimism going. Um, and then I guess I'm going to just sort of let myself write without thinking about COVID-19. Personally, in my case, and I know that if this goes longer, you know, we have to write what we know. But I'm not personally interested in writing a story about COVID-19 right now. <laughs> like, I'm just not doing it. I'm not going to be the one. So some people have said, oh, well, you know, season four of Pineapple Diaries, I guess they're going to be doing COVID-19. But that's like, wasn't my plan. So I think what I'm going to do is just write the script of my dreams, whether it will be possible or not. I guess that's what you do anyways, even sans pandemic um you know you kind of write what you feel you write what your imagination pushes you to write and then later on you decide what you can and cannot do but so that's what i'm gonna do i'm just gonna let myself write the script of my dreams <laughs> no COVID 19 storylines and then just see where where things go i have nothing is in my control except you know the computer in front of me and the ideas in my head Love that. Thank you so much, Paloma. We truly appreciate your insight and hearing how things are going for you. Um, and if anybody, and like we said, we'll be sending the slideshow um, to all the participants. And Paloma, you're welcome to put your website in the chat as well, so people can check out your stuff and be able to get you as many people to view your amazing work. Oh, Thanks thank again, Paloma. You. Thank you. Thank you, Paloma. Uh, all right. So we're gonna take the next ten minutes to open it up back to questions. If anybody is still having some questions uh, from Luke about unemployment or uh, Elizabeth, if you could take us back to maybe where we left off, if there were any questions that weren't able to be answered in that time we were doing before. Yeah, and before we get started, I just wanted to um, um, bring forward a few great relief funds that people have been commenting in the group chat um, that we did not mention in our PowerPoint today. So. Um, Karen mentioned the Tyco Community Alliance Relief Fund, which is a relief fund for Tyco artists. Um, they have an upcoming deadline of April 30th, and that's a grant of $500. Um, the Singers Resource Relief Fund will actually be reopening soon for applications. So they've already done one round, and they aren't currently open, but they will be reopening within the next several days. Um, then we also had mentioned the National COVID Relief Fund for Black and Latinx Youth. So that's a creative reaction lab um, program, and it's $100 per grant. And tomorrow is the deadline. So if you know any um, young people, um, Black and Latinx young people artists, um, please let them know about that. And then, um, or if you are one, um, and then last but not least, um, we had the Boston Mutual Aid Fund mentioned as well. And there's links to all of this in the, um, in the chat, but we, again, will aggregate all this information for you all to have after. Okay, thank you so much, Julia. We have um, four questions um, for Luke. Lucas? Yeah. Um, question one, what if I only have uh, 1099? That's fine. Then you would still apply for, you would apply for the pandemic unemployment assistance application instead of traditional unemployment. But yeah, that's okay if you just have 1099 income, 
just make sure you have all that documentation together and that you have a clear record, um, you know, have all that financial information together for when the department does ask you to submit proof of income that you have, that that's readily available, but it's totally okay if you have just 1099 income. Next question, what if um, that W-2 employer laid me off because they went out of business due to COVID? How long am I still eligible to collect through regular UI if I only, if I, if I know I'm not going back to work there? Um, I mean, you would still, so is the person, so the person is still currently on unemployment? or on traditional unemployment? Oh, okay, so how long does traditional unemployment last? Um, yes, so so they were laid off um, due to the business going out of business due to COVID, and mm -hmm. they wanted to know how long are they eligible to collect on regular unemployment? If they're not able to go back to the original yeah. employer. I think in that circumstance it would be, it would depend more on the original um, unemployment duration, which I think is on a case-by-case -case basis. I think per your individual application, they determine the duration of your benefits. So it, I, I think they divide like your maximum benefit by what your weekly benefit is gonna be, and that's how you determine what the duration will be. So I think it would be until that term runs out, I know that the term for pandemic unemployment assistance is, I believe, thir up to 39 weeks. Um, but I don't have a better answer for that question. I think it's going to depend on what your original unemployment insurance term will be. They did reply that they were on a traditional unemployment. Okay. Um, next question um, is, I earned income from a full-time on W-2 job last year, but I quit that job in November and I'm mostly self-employed now. I'm assuming I still have to go through regular unemployment first to get denied? That might be the case just because your W-2 employment from the previous year will trigger that threshold that says, and the pandemic unemployment application that says, well, you've earned more than $5,100, so go apply through regular unemployment insurance and then come back. So that you'll likely end up having to go through, you'll, you'll probably end up ultimately receiving the benefits through the pandemic unemployment assistance program, but you're probably gonna have to go through the, um, through the traditional first. And I will make a note that um, someone did drop in the chat that they were told by the people at the unemployment office that I guess the $5,100 might've been a typo and it should have been, $5,100 per month and not $5,100 per week. Um, so that I don't, I'm, I am relying on the information from the Department of Unemployment Assistance website. I don't have really much more of an inside scoop than what I know from their own publications. So maybe that could be right. Um, all I know is that currently it says $5,100. If you earn 50, more than $5,100 in the past year, then that is the threshold. And I know it does seem like that's a really small number. I, I noticed that, that was a low threshold, but unless they've updated it, that's what we have to rely upon. And that's what the application is still built upon. At least the pandemic unemployment application is built upon still. If you say that you've earned more than this, it's going to bump you and tell you to go through traditional unemployment. So um, thank you for that insight. If it's right, I'm. Uh, I, that I don't know. Um, Lucas, you have, we have um, three, three more minutes or so. We have mm -hmm. three more questions. Okay. Um, next question is, I applied for a PUA yesterday and ran into the roadblock of having a job in 2019 in which I made more than 5,100 that year from a single employer who withheld taxes. Mm -hmm. Since December 2019, I have moved to the, um, to the strictly freelance. Mm -hmm. However, because I answered that question in the affirmation on the PUA app, 
of making 5,100 in 2019, I was ineligible to receive those funds. And I was recommended to apply for regular unemployment, which I'm hearing you say it is the correct path. However, I called and spoke directly with a PUA representative who told me explicitly that the 5,100 annual trestle is a typo. Oh yes, you just- Oh yeah, yeah that was a question. Yes, I'm so sorry. No problem, um, and then, thanks Nate for pointing that out. Then next to question is, um, is similar to Nate's more than um, 5,200 in attempting income in 2019 for lost money this spring in 1099 gigs, still traditional unemployment or PUA based on the spring 2020 gigs, 2019 income from W2 and, 2000, and 1099 exceeds 2020 spring gigs. Think, oh, I'm sorry. I thought that was a question too. <laughs> I no worries. Think, I think that is all for you. We do have one question for Julia. Um, someone wrote, how, does, how long does it take to hear back on a grant they applied in March and still haven't heard back? Um, yeah, I can answer that. So we have funded the first 57 grants um, that were eligible that we've received. Um, and those were just in the first few days of the grant being open. Um, and the next round of grant funding should be going out this week through the Boston Center for the Arts um, through their fundraising efforts. So applicants um, from here on out should be hearing directly from the Boston Center for the Arts if they've received um, approval. We, I think, with the amount of money they're going to be able to start dispersing soon, we're going to be able to fund um, about a hundred, a little over a hundred more um, applicants. So that still only gets us into mid-March um, with our applications. So there's a lot of applications that we are collecting and holding on to that we haven't been able to review yet. Um, we did do an update last week to applicants just about kind of where we are in the process, but we'll plan on continuing to do that. And if you haven't heard back yet, that's either because um, we haven't gotten to your application um, or we're just in the process of reviewing it. Awesome, thank you so much, Julia. If anybody else has questions for Luke, um, he's gonna put his email in the chat, So, and we'll also send out some more information about unemployment, so please feel free to send, uh, send him an email about your questions if they come up. Uh, we have a couple more minutes, we just wanna share some other uh, resources for you all before we uh, close out this meeting. Uh, you'll see on this on the PowerPoint, we do have a list of arts events on our on the boston.gov websites. If you want to submit a virtual event that you'd like to be shared on this calendar, please submit it to the boston.gov slash arts dash support, and we'll make sure to put it up on the website so that people are able to access it. Next slide. Oh, and like we said, we are hoping to have these meetings as frequent as possible. We're trying to do them once a week, um, but we'd like to hear from you all if this time slot works for everybody. So, um, Julia, if you could, uh, if we could put the link to the to the survey in the chat, we'd love for you all to uh, let us know what you think about a good timing, as well as um, there is an option in the form. Um, to put questions, resources, things that you are looking for answers from this so we can provide them for you. Um, so we'd really appreciate it. It's probably like a five minute survey, should not take you too long. Um, and it would be super helpful for us so we know how to continue to support you all and get you the info. We also, um, the in the graphic below, we also have a creative workers and artists survey that we can, that we are culminating at the mayor's office of arts and culture so we can understand how everyone, especially the artists, gig workers, and freelancers have been affected by COVID-19 and how we can advocate for better funding and better legislation, legislation so that we are able to come back from this and that this is something that's always on the mind 
hands of the people who are supporting us. Um, so please, we would really, really appreciate it if you all could fill out these two surveys. They shouldn't take longer than 10, 15 minutes total. Um, and if you have any questions about them, you're welcome to email me or Julia, and we'll try to help you with that. Um, is there anything else? I think, is that the last thing, Julia? Yeah, I think that's the last thing. I'm just, um, I was just dropping these um, links in right now. So Perfect. Thank you. Those. There was one last question for yes. the group. Mm -hmm. um, time slot. Is it possible to change the time to not overlap with Stage Store's weekly community Zoom? So yes. At 11. Yes, that is one of the, there are two options in the survey link for, either, I think it's like 2.30 to 3.30 or, or 3.30 to 4.30. So that is one of the reasons why we were interested in hearing from you all what time works for you. Um, so we do want to make sure that everyone is available to meet and be able to hear the information. So please fill out the survey so we can figure out which time works best for everyone. Thanks so much. Elizabeth, is there any other questions? Um, was double checking to make sure I didn't miss any. Um, there were two last questions for um, Lucas, but people were going to email him directly. Great. Yeah, that's awesome. fine. Perfect. Great. Um, and I think, um, Pascal, just I would like to really emphasize um, we really want to thank you in advance um, for filling out this survey for creative workers and artists. Um, and please. Um, we just ask that you all share this um, mm -hmm. survey as broadly as you can to help us really aggregate this information for our state and we thank you for that. Yes, and thank you so much to all of our speakers um, today for helping us. Uh, we'll, as we continue with these meetings, we'll have different speakers come on. So if there are people that you're interested in hearing from, specific organizations or institutions that you'd like to hear some information from, please put that info in the survey that we've put in so we can be able to assist you in that. Um, anything else, Julia, that I missed? Nope. All right, well, thank you all so much. We'll be sending out the slide deck to all the participants. So if you have any questions or anything, please email me or Julia and we'll be happy to help you all. Thank you so much for coming. And I will just drop my email address in here right now to make sure everyone- Mine too. All right, thank you everyone so much and I hope you all have a great rest of your afternoon.